Nije nova misao da je stalna jedino promjena. Ali što je to promjena? Je li promjena isto što i kriza? Tako najčešće doživljavamo promjene, ali tako ne mora biti. Američki autor Neil Donald Walsh, kao i mnogi nekad i sada, ukazuje na izvor problema, a to je naš doživljaj promjene. Postoje sredstva i način kako promijeniti naš doživljaj promjene, ali to je nemoguće bez zadiranja u principe kako život zapravo funkcionira, ili bolje rečeno u naše predođbe o tome kako život funkcionira. Naše predođbe o životu su u samoj biti odgovora na pitanje zašto se promjene događaju i kako se nositi s njima, i na kraju kako ih transformirati u nešto bolje od onog što se trenutno proživljava. Tako smo za promjenu s Nilom Donaldo Walshom susret dogovorili ovdje, na rubu znanosti. Za početak, gospodine Walsh, dobar dan. Thank you, it's lovely to be with you. I appreciate the opportunity. Za početak, popričamo o vremenu u kojem živimo, s obzirom da je danas sve jasnije u kojoj mjeri zapravo čovjek treba proučiti svoje vlastite navike mišljenja i na neki način se od njih odmaknuti. Živimo u vrijeme koje ima jako velike promjene, možda čak i neviđene po svojoj brzini, čak što više zbivaju se unutar jedne generacije. Kako... Pred kojim izazovima su ljudi u kontekstu tih brzih promjena koje više nisu u rasponu od 50 godina, 30, 20, nego čak na godišnjoj razini? I think the challenge for most people is that we have not really been taught in specific terms about how we might most beneficially deal with change. People have a resistance to change. It's a natural resistance. Most people would like things to stay the same. They want their family situation to stay the same. They want their work situation to stay the same. They, they, they don't, understandably, don't want upheaval, but no one is teaching us how to deal with upheaval and change. We don't learn it in school. We don't learn it in church. We, we don't learn it in our families. We don't, we simply don't have the equipment to deal with change. And I, I want to suggest to you that I believe that the equipment is largely, not exclusively, but largely spiritual. That is, when we have a deeper, richer understanding of the purpose of change, why things change in our life, and how we can use change to advance uh, the agenda of the human soul, suddenly change becomes not only something that we can deal with, but in fact, in an interesting way, something we can look forward to. But in order for us to embrace such a notion, which is radical for sure, we would have to have first embraced the idea that we do have a soul. We would have to have a different idea about who we are as entities. Who are we really? Why are we on the earth? What is the point of life when it's all said and done? And what, if anything, happens at the end of this physical experience? Once we've answered those large questions, the smaller issues of how to transform change into a tool that drives the evolutionary process forward uh, begins to answer itself. So I think that the opportunity in front of human beings right now is to change our idea about change itself. What is the purpose of it? What is the point of it? What, what uh, can it be used for beneficially? And uh, how can we embrace the dynamics of change in such a way that we actually begin to look forward to these alterations in our life? So I'm, you know, I'm, I'm sad to say that human beings have not really been told about these things uh, by many people. Well, I've, you know, I didn't learn anything about this in school. I had to learn about this uh, in a most unusual way. Spomenuli ste da je da se radi o duhovnoj promjeni, međutim ta promjena ima jako puno veze i sa psihološkim mehanizmima našim i sa načinom kako naša neuroplastika radi i u stvari se može reći da se radi o zatočenosti u navike mišljenja i obrazce mišljenja kojih ljudi nisu svjesni. Koja je ta veza koja se u konačnici može povezati između 
duhovnih stremljenja prema promjeni i one prakse i vježbe koje na kraju utječe da se i naš biološki sustav postupno mijenja jer mi ipak smo bića u tijelu, a nismo samo duhovna bića koja plute u nekom prostoru. Drugim rečima, koje sve discipline i koja sve promatrana čovjeka se spajaju kada pričamo o ovakvoj tehnici koja se u stvari može zvati pomnost ili mindfulness? I think we have to change our mind about who we are, about the essence uh, of our being. I think we have to see ourselves as more than simply a body and a mind, but really as a three-part being. Some people give lip service, what we call lip service, that they say, they talk about these things, but they don't really live them. Some people say, yeah, yeah, we all have a soul. We're a body and we're a mind and we have a soul. But the fact is that most people on the earth maybe focus 10% of their time on matters of the soul and the rest of their time they spend dealing with, as you say, their body and their mind because we see ourselves as this. So the answer is to see ourselves in a new way. I've observed that 95% of the world's people are spending 95% of their time on things that don't matter. That is, things that have nothing to do with our true agenda. So the way that we can get out of this cage that we're in is to have the courage, have the willingness to adopt a new perspective, to see ourselves in a new way, to see ourselves as three-part beings, body, mind, and soul, and to begin to see that the soul is the most important, not the least important aspect of who we are. That the soul is the aspect of us that has the true agenda for life itself uh, under its control. And so our opportunity is to begin living life from the soul's agenda, using the body and the mind as tools of the soul with which to complete the agenda. Our agenda is spiritual, not physical. We're not here to you know, do all the things that people do in their physical lives. Get the guy, get the girl, get the car, get the job, get the house, get the spouse, get the children, get the better job, get the better car, get the better spouse, get the better house, get the better spouse, get the better spouse, get the better spouse, get the better spouse you know, and then finally get your name on the office door in the corner and maybe you get the retirement watch and you get the gray hair and then you get out after because you're done the game is over really is that the sum total of human experience is that what we're here for no it turns out there's more going on here than meets the eye or as william shakespeare put it i thought eloquently There are more things in heaven and earth, Horatio, than are dreamt of in your philosophy. So when we begin to understand that life is not about these things I've just mentioned, it's okay to do those things. We do those things as a part of the process through which we serve what life is really about. But life is really about, in my understanding, the agenda of the soul. And when we begin to serve that agenda, all these changes that occur in our life become tools with which to advance our agenda. And we not only experience our changes in a different way, but as I mentioned earlier, we actually begin to look forward to them. We actually begin to anticipate them and we actually begin to create them. And life becomes not a process of reaction to all the changes, but a process of creating the changes in such a way that we are finally serving our true reason for being alive, which has nothing to do with your job, your relationship, of these things that I mentioned before. Those are all wonderful aspects of human experience. I'm not making them wrong. I'm simply saying that they are methods by which we advance the agenda of the soul. So what I've learned in my life is to begin to see life from a totally different perspective from the perspective of the soul rather than the perspective of the body and the mind. 
U stvari se sve može svesti na pitanje stvaram li ili vidim. Najveći izazov u praksi ovog što vi pričate je izaći iz okvira akcije i reakcije, drugim rečima na neki način stvoriti prostor između onog što bi trebala biti akcija i stvoriti perspektivu da čovjek zapravo može stvari pogledati izvana. U vašoj knjizi koju ste nazvali devet promjena koje će promijeniti sve, ste napravili devet koraka. Koji bi tih devet koraka ukratko bili, pa možemo poslije malo detaljnije o njima? I should have studied my own book. Um, I, I wrote that book eight, seven or eight years ago. I'm not sure I have the whole list memorized, but I do know some of the major things. We want to change uh, our idea of change itself and stop seeing it as something that we want to resist. So I think the first change is, is to change our idea about change itself. We also want to change our um, behavior m m m when change occurs. Many people, when changes happen in their lives, self-isolate. That is, they step outside of uh, their normal, normal social interactions, even, their, even in their own family, and they tend to spend a lot of time by themselves. So we want to change that behavior of isolating ourselves uh, and, uh, and change our idea of of change itself. We want to change our response to change. And we want to change our, our thought about why change is occurring. And most important, we want to change our thought about who is causing the change. See, we think that change is happening to us. But the truth is that change is happening through us. That we're not standing on the side of everything, watching all this happen, we have a co-creative role in the process. Our exterior experience, that is the experience outside of my body, is being co-created collaboratively by all the souls who are involved in any given moment and in any given passage through life. Our interior experience, what I'm experiencing inside, of course, is created by me and by me alone. That's what's meant by we create our own reality, that I'm creating my reality internally here, but we are collaboratively creating the exterior reality. And there's a reason that we're creating it in the way that it's being created. The exterior reality, the changes that occur uh, in all of our lives, are being created collaboratively to serve the individual agenda of all, how would I put this, of all the players in the game, of all the people, all the souls who are involved. So I think uh, among those nine changes is we want to begin to change our idea of the purpose of life, change our thought about who we are, change our conception of why change is occurring, change our thought about who is creating change, change our idea that we are the victims of the changes that occur in our life, and most important, change our idea of what will happen once the change takes place. I make an extraordinary statement in the book, a statement that was given to me in my conversations with God, and that statement is this, Consider the possibility that all change is change for the better. That all change is change for the better. That there's no such thing as change that's change for the worse. There are alterations that occur in our lives that seem like change for the worse, that appear to be change for the worse, but in terms of the agenda of the soul, Every change is designed perfectly to move forward our evolutionary agenda, to cause opportunities for growth, expansion, and a larger experience, a greater awareness of our true identity. Given that that's what's true, and given what our true identity is, it would really be impossible for us to be victims in the highest spiritual sense 
of the changes that occur in our lives. So that's the biggest of the nine changes, is to change our idea about change itself and to begin to embrace the notion that all change is change for the better. Let me add one thing about that. When a person begins to embrace the idea that all change is change for the better, they change their response to the changes that are occurring. When they change their response to the changes that are occurring, shifting from frustration and disappointment and maybe even anger to acceptance and joyfulness and excitement, that shifts the energetic projection that each person moves out, out from them and projects onto the experience itself. Energy is a wonderful uh, uh, aspect of life. Energy affects energy itself. If something is occurring energetically here and we throw negative energy at it, that negative energy that we throw at it is going to create a negative impact over here. On the other hand, if something is happening over here energetically and we throw positive energy at it, it's going to have a trans transformative impact on what's happening over here and could very well shift and alter the original event that we thought was so bad to begin with. So the opportunity is for us to shift the exterior reality by changing our interior response to change itself. U stvari glavna razlika koje, o kojoj mi pričamo je razlika između doživljaja i događaja i mi često puta mislimo da je naš doživljaj u stvari sam događaj, mada on to u stvari nije. Naravno uvjetovani smo svojim nekim navikama. Na koji način čovjek može što može raditi da istupi iz tog čvrstog stiska navika koje ga uporno vraćaju u stare e, obrazce. Jer jedna je stvar mentalno shvatiti, a druga stvar je u stvari na neki način integrirati to u svoj e, život. Um, you're asking a, a very profound question. It may be one of the most important questions in life. How to, you, what you're discussing is how to change concept into function or concept into experience. We can have, as you've just said, a concept about ourselves. I am patient, I am understanding, I am forgiving, I'm kind, uh, I'm gentle, and then something happens. And in our, our visceral response, our physical response, and even our mental response sometimes overrides all the concepts that we had about those things. I'm very familiar with that because that, that happens in my life all the time. And I wrote the book. And it, and it happens to me, although it happens less and less and less. So the tools that I have used and that I invite other people to use to reduce the number of times that we have those reactions until finally we get to a place of zero, where, where, which is where masters live. And there are certain people who have mastered life in that, in that way, who've gotten down to zero. I'm not at zero yet, but I'm about maybe 30 or 40 percent away from zero, where I don't do that anymore. But right now, three times out of ten, I still react that way. The tools that I offer myself and others are discipline, commitment, understanding, and really in a reverse order. First, understanding. And I, I'm repeating myself, I'm sorry, but I want to say again, we have to understand who we are at, at our fundamental basis. Who are we? Are we simply chemical creatures? Are we really simply just biological entities, not unlike a whale or a dolphin or a bird in the sky, perhaps more complex, but basically a human, just a mammal, an animal? Or are we in fact a spiritual entity that has a body and has a mind, but that is essentially a spiritual entity? So the first level of, of the first tool that I offer people is understanding. People must come to a brand new understanding of who we really are. What is our true identity? I assert and I claim and I suggest that our true identity is we are a spiritual entity. I'm not my body. This is not who I am. I'm not even my mind. But my body and my mind are tools that are used by who I really am. If I embrace that notion as my reality, I, then I can begin to, to take the pathway from concept to experience. But first I must gain that understanding. I must decide. It's a decision I make. You know what? I am actually a spiritual entity. And I have to ask myself some questions then. When I decide that I'm a spiritual entity, I have to ask myself a profound question. What am I doing here? Why would a spiritual entity come to a, a physical reality? What would be the point of that? 
Until I become clear on that, I do not have a full understanding with which to engage the events and the circumstances and the situations of my life. But if I have that full understanding, and I've written nine books on this, so I couldn't possibly give it to you in a brief interview, but once we get that full understanding of who we are and why we're here, then we go to the second tool, which is commitment. We must be committed. We must make an agreement with ourselves. We must commit within ourselves to take that understanding and put it into action and translate it from concept to experience. And we must be determined and determined to do that. It takes determination and commitment and understanding. So in my life, I see the various events that occur in my life, including this interview. And what happened to me this morning at, you know, when they brought room service to my hotel room and what happened to me on the airplane at the airport and all the things that happened in my life, the big things and the small things. I have to see each of those events as an invitation. Ah, I see it, an invitation for me to decide once again, to declare once again, and then to demonstrate once again who I really am. Thus to move forward and to advance the evolution of my soul, which is what I came here to do, which is what all entities have come into the physical reality to do, to move forward the agenda of the soul, which is to evolve and become a grander and grander version of who they really are. Definicije su korisne i ta pitanja s obzirom da čovjek mora prvo znati s čime ima posla. Pa prvo pitanje je bilo znači ko smo mi. Drugo pitanje svakako bi bilo što je zapravo onaj kaos koji se ljudima događa u životu, uz što je on vezan. I vi ste u knjizi objasnili da se on tiče takozvane velike trojke. Odnosi, novac i zdravlje. I kad se to tako postavi, odjednom čovjek čak i vidi da su to nekakve pojave koje opet nema u veze s njim čim ih je imenovao. Pa ako biste mogli malo objasniti na koji način te tri stvari u stvari drže ljude uporno u obrazcima i na neki način nudići im iskustvo da nadiđu same sebe, također im rekli bi se stavljaju utege na noge pa ih to opet povlači prema dolje i onda u toj jednoj panici zapravo ne mogu na neki način ni stvoriti taj prostor. Unless they are not taking us down unless in fact they're not weighing us down, unless in fact we use our relationships, our money experience, and our health as aspects of life that in, that in fact lift us up. When we see the purpose of all of life, including the big three, relationships, money, and health, when we see the purpose of them, we then look at them differently. We actually have a different perspective on them and we don't see them as things that drag us down, even when they appear to be presenting circumstances that might drag another person down. But there are people on the planet, and I know a couple of them, who encounter the same problems that you and I encounter about relationships, money, and health, and they don't get them down. Eckhart Tolle happens to be one of them. I know Eckhart Tolle well. He's a wonderful human being, but you, you couldn't upset him, even if his relationship fell apart tomorrow even if he wound up with no money on Tuesday, even if he had a, a health challenge that he was facing, he would not find himself being dragged down and weighted down because he would see that those events, those circumstances in his life are perfectly designed to allow him the best opportunity he could create to decide and to declare, to express and to fulfill, to become and to experience fully who he really is. So he sees those kinds of experiences in life as invitations, opportunities. And you'd have a hard time talking to someone like the Dalai Lama or the great Buddhist monk Thich Nhat Hanh. People like that exist. Well, I'm not making these people up. These aren't fictional characters in a, in a storybook. These are people are alive walking the planet right now. And they're demonstrating in daily life that it's very possible for us to see these big three, and all the rest of life for that matter, as opportunities and invitations. Now, you know, the, the biggest of those big three for me is relationships. Our relationships, not only romantic relationships with uh, our life partner, perhaps, but our relationships with everybody, with the person, the bank teller, the policeman on the street corner, the, the, the clerk in the store, our relationship, and by the way, our relationships with ourselves.
When we see the sacred, extraordinary platform that our relationships offer us, when we see that our relationships actually have nothing to do with us, let me share with you the biggest lesson I learned about relationship because I've been through many relationships in my life. I've had multiple marriages and I've had many other relationships in business and friendships and children and so forth in my life. Very important relationships. One after the other, after the other, after the other. And most of my relationships in marriage failed because I simply didn't understand the purpose of relationship or the purpose of my life. But then I was given an, an extraordinary piece of information. I was told, Neil, consider the possibility that your life has nothing to do with you. Nothing to do with you. Consider the possibility that your life is really about everyone else whose life you touch and the way in which you touch it. Consider the possibility that the only reason relationship exists is to provide you an invitation and an opportunity to give to that relationship all that you have to give that you might then express who you really are. If you did that on a daily basis, do you think your relationship would improve and be better than it was before? The answer to me is obviously yes. And I have demonstrated that in my most recent marriage and in my most recent interactions with other people in these most recent years of my life. But the first 50 years of my life, the first half century, I thought that the purpose of relationship was to see what I could get out of it. You know, I would marry a person because they seemed to have everything I've always wanted and they could give me everything I always hoped for. And the same thing in business relationships, I can get what I've always wanted and what I've always hoped for. It's always about me, 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 me. Maybe I'm unusual. Maybe I'm not like everybody else. Perhaps I'm really a bad person, or I was. But as I observe the world, I see more than one other person acting in the same way. But when I decided that my relationships existed for a whole different reason, not to see what I could get out of them, but to see what I could put into them, that was not a small change for me. And it was the same way in my relationship with money. Not, you know, how can I get as much money, what do I need to do to get as much money in my life as I can? What, what kind of a job do I need to get? What kind of, but really, what, how, what can I do in my financial life that I contribute so much to the lives of others and I contribute so much to life itself more broadly that people actually, how do I put this, almost throw money at me? I mean, look at you. I, I, I'm going to bet that you get paid to do what you're doing here. I don't think you're doing this for nothing. You probably get a salary, and you probably get a, a, a very nice salary for doing what you do. If someone had told you when you were 16 years old, you know what, they're gonna pay you to sit in a chair and talk, and that's gonna be your whole life. Don't have to construct buildings, don't have to go outside with a jackhammer, you don't have, you, you're gonna sit in a chair and talk, and they're gonna give you money for that. And they're gonna give you money because, but why would they do that? Because you don't just sit in the chair and talk. You sit in the chair and you contribute to the conversation that enlivens and expands people's lives. That's what you do. That's what you get paid for. And people give you money to do that. So suddenly you discover that your relationships, your money, and even your health will turn out to be better than you ever thought it was before because you have a deep sense of what you're doing on the planet. You're not just hanging out trying to get by. You're hanging out to see what you can offer to life itself. You're that kind of person. I can sense it in you. And I bet if I talk to 10 people who know you, they would say you have got him exactly right. Malo prije ste spomenuli uh, rečenicu mi, mi, mi. Zapravo je zanimljivo jer ponekad ne, jedan primjer govori više od tisuću riječi. Znači mi smo sad teoretski raspravljali o toj temi. Međutim, u vašoj knjizi dajete dva dobra primjera, a takvi bi se primjera moglo naći jako puno, koje zorno to prikazuju. Jer ta, taj spiritualni pogled na stvari o kojem govorite zapravo elementarna jednostavna logika. Primjerice, spominjate jednog čovjeka koji je rekao da on je jaran ostavljen, da bi se ispostavilo da ga je samo cura ostavila, ali ga nisu ostavili mama, tata, djeca ni drugi, znači on zapravo i nije bio ostavljen samo mu se činilo. Spominjate osobu koju ste preplašili, pa ona rekla, vi ste me preplašili, a vi ste u stvari rekla, ne, 
sami ste se preplašili, u vama je strah. Ovo što ste čuli su samo senzacije, zvuk i tako dalje. Zašto je to vas uplašilo, ja ne znam. Drugim rečima, takvi primjeri pokazuju na koji način mi ne primjenjujemo čistu logiku u životu. Pa na koji način se sa ljudima susrećete i u kojim rasponima u stvari su ljudi vezani uz interpretaciju svog doživlja umjesto uz jednostavnu logiku koja se stvara time što imaš malo širi pogled na stvari? The main problem is a lack of willingness to step away from their previously held cultural story about who they are, the reason for life, why things are the way they are, what things are scary, what things are not okay. You know, the, in, in other words, the, the main problem is we're using the data of our mind, which is collected through all the years since we were born, Uh, and we, we imagine that that data is accurate. So that if somebody leaves you, if your girlfriend leaves you and your relationship is over, you're supposed to feel terrible about that. You're supposed to feel that you were not treated properly, you were not treated justly, and uh, you've been injured, and, and, and you, that, because that's how people are supposed to feel. After all, that's how it is in the movies, that's how it is in the books that we read, all the information we've gotten. So we're, we're basing our response to life's events on what we've been told and what the mind has gathered from a many different sources, hardly ever from its own experience. What I say to people when I work with them is, how much of what you're reacting with has to do with your actual experience as opposed to how you think you're supposed to react when, when these kinds of things occur? Let me give you a perfect example. I have a friend whose name is Byron Katie. And uh, Katie calls herself by her last name. And Katie's a marvelous human being. And she tells the story of how she was uh, in uh, one of the big cities in, the, in America. And uh, some man pulled her off the street, pulled her into an alley. And he pulled a gun on her. And he said, give me all of your valuables. So she gave him her watch. And she gave him her ring. And, and she gave him the money she had in her handbag. But she was looking directly into his eyes. And, and she wasn't afraid of him. And he looked at her and he said, you know, uh, I, I'm really sorry that you've gotten such a good look at me because I'm, now I'm going, to have to, I'm going to have to kill you because you, 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 you see who I am. You've, you haven't looked away. You've looked right in my face. So he put a silencer on the gun. He said, I'm going to have to kill you. I'm sorry, but I didn't, I didn't realize you'd get such a good look at me. And she looked at him. Ordinary person would be, you know, and get very scared. But she looked at him and she said, Do the best you can do. You need to do the best you can do. In this situation, if that's the best solution you can come up with, you need to do the best you can do. Because she was not coming from the previous data of her mind, which tells her to be upset, scared, run, you know, scream, cry, whatever. She was coming from a whole different place in her reality. <laughs> and, and he looked at her and he said, lady, you're crazy. He dropped the gun. He dropped her handbag. He just turned around and ran away. He realized he had, he had run into a crazy person. Well, it wasn't really a crazy person at all. It was, a, a, as you say, a very logical, oriented person who was clear about what is so and what is not so. So here's the answer to the condition we find ourselves in. We have to decide, we have to commit to expanding our understanding so we come to great clarity about what is really true, what is so, and what is not so. Katie developed a whole process around this, which she calls the work. And when we confront any situation in our life, we're invited to engage the process that she calls self-inquiry, in which we ask ourselves three important questions. One, is it true? Is it really true, what you think is true? Number two, how does it make you feel when you think that it's true? And number three, what would change for you if you thought that it wasn't true? <laughs> Those are very important, intriguing questions. When human beings begin to engage that kind of logical process, that kind of thought system, to say nothing of some of the solutions that a spiritual point of view, the, the point of view of the soul that I often talk about, bring to us, When we make a commitment, you know, there's more here than meets the eye. 
there's more here than I understand. When we make a commitment to engage that information and to bring it into our life, to use it functionally and not just conceptually, all these responses that you're talking about that are automatic responses change. And our automatic responses, our reactions become creations. And life becomes not a process of reaction, but a process of creation. And I get to create moment to moment who I now choose to be, even as I'm doing right here in this interview. It's happening right in front of your face. Ovaj primjer koji ste spomenuli jako dobar po pitanju teme kojom se bavite u knjizi, a ona je reč o odabiru svojih emocija. Naravno, nameće se pitanje otkud one proizlaze, odnosno što je sponsor tih emocija, kako ste to nazvali. I naravno, često puta se tu pojavljuje reći strah, pa onda se često puta i strah miješa sa ljubavlju i sl. Možete li objasniti tu ideju o sponsoru svih emocija? Jer ako čovjek želi promijeniti odabir svojih emocija, kao što je ova osoba promijenila u toj mračnoj uličici, pa odlučila neću se bojati nego nešto drugo, ona je zapravo ukinula sponzora svih emocija, nešto se promijenilo. Međutim, ljudi su vezani uz emocije, one ih tjeraju na plakanje, na strah, na želju. Na koji način se uopće može promijeniti odabir svojih emocija? Da, to je veoma dobro pitanje. Let me begin my answer by telling you that emotions are not things that come over us. Many people think that I was overcome by emotion and I didn't have, I didn't have much choice. How I feel is how I feel. Uh, but the great revelation that has been given to me is that we do in fact choose our emotion. The mind selects the emotion it wishes to experience. It does it lightning fast, I will admit that, it, as fast as that. But it does make the choice. And how we can change our emotion is by going back in the hall of mirrors and changing the conditions which produce the emotions that we are feeling. For instance, we change our thought about the event. Let's pick an event. Let's say the event is somebody pulls a gun on you. Say, what is my thought about that event? Well, my thought is this is a very dangerous situation. I could die here. I, you know, and, and uh, th this is a, a very a difficult situation to be in, and I need to be, I need to be scared. But what, then we, then we, we, so, but we can change that thought when we change our truth about the event someone pulls a gun on you. And truth comes in three, le in three uh, uh, truth comes in three brand names, I could call it, at the truth store. You can buy into the imagined truth or the, the um, you could buy into the apparent truth or you could buy into the actual truth. Depending on which truth you buy into, you will have a thought about the event that generates the emotion that you express and uh, decide to experience uh, through you. So we have to decide what's really true. That's, that's where Katie's work is so important. What's really true here uh, about this situation? Uh, but what is our truth based on? Our truth is based on the data that our mind holds about the event. The data that your mind holds about somebody pulling a gun on you is probably that this is a very dangerous situation that I'm in and I, I, I could die right here. I have to do something to protect myself. But what's interesting about how Katie reacted was she didn't feel she had to do something to protect herself. Her concern was not for herself. Her concern was actually for him. She said, you know what? You have to do what's best for you. If that's the best you can do, you need to do that. And he was so dumbfounded. He was so struck. He was so uh, you know, uh, unbelievable about what he was hearing that he actually dropped the gun and realized he was in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the space of a crazy, crazy lady. Didn't know, didn't know how to react, but she did know how to react. So the answer to how one changes one's emotion is to change what you're thinking about what's happening by changing the truth that you hold with regard to what's happening by exploring deeply the data that your mind has given you with regard to what's happening to make sure that data is accurate because almost all the data that the mind holds about what's going on in our life is inaccurate. It's false data. It's not true. It's not real. It's something that we have either made up or been told by somebody else and has nothing to do with our actual experience. Mara, ste rekli da niste dugo čitali svoju knjigu pa ne znate na broj svojih devet promjena, ali zapravo su one 
integralni dio, kako to već ide u holografskom modelu, svaki dijelica drži na neki način cijelinu. Tako da ste u stvari većinu tih točaka sažili u ovim rečenicama. Na kraju se dolazi do toga da zapravo čovjek treba na neki način promijeniti ideju o budućim promjenama i promijeniti svoj identitet. Ta ista ideja danas na neki način kroz mnogo puteva dolazi do ljudi. U korporacijama se direktore poručava mindfulnessu, Jody Spence u knjizi Placebo, ste vi opet koristite i tu istu metodu i on je to nazvao stvaranje novog ja. Znači, kada jednom čovjek uz dovoljno vježbe i dnevne prakse, da tako kažemo, počne postupno stvarati razmak između svojih emocija, doživljaja, pitanja što ja to vidim, je li ova prodavačica namrgođena zato jer me mrzi ili je samo usta stoje u krivu, a to nema nikakve veze sa mnom. Dolazimo do pitanja kako promijeniti ideje, dakle da budemo praktični, o budućim promjenama i u konečnici svoj identitet. Pa na koji način i kako u vašem iskustvu i iskustvu drugih ljudi do toga dolazi? Jer zapravo bi ljudi htjeli u stvari imati neki učinak od onog što se u njima događa, a u stvari se događa u vrlo praktične stvari, mada izgledaju vrlo abstraktno i spiritualno. When we change, what it means to change your idea about future change is to alter your perception about anything in the future that may be different from the way it is right now. And we alter our perception by accepting the notion, by embracing the idea that no matter what happens, it's going to be for my own good. That it's not possible for anything to change that would be in any way detrimental or damaging to myself in the largest sense of why I'm here on earth. Um, I, I often use the example, you know, I've, I've said, I've asked many people in lectures, uh, if I've mentioned this before here, tell me and stop me, but I give lectures all over the world and I, I sit in front of hundreds of people and I say to them, how many of you have had an experience in your life that you thought was the worst change that could ever happen to you only to find out two months or maybe two years later that it was the best thing that ever happened to you. How many of you have experienced that? And all the hands in the hall go up. 95% of the hands say, yeah, I've had that experience. I say, ah, the master is the one who knows that ahead of time because he's changed his idea about future change. He doesn't have to wait two years to see how it all turns out. He knows ahead of time that it's all going to turn out just like it did in the past. He's learned from his own experience. He's still here, still sitting in the chair. Everything is fine. He's, he's, he's okay, and he can go forward with his life, even though two years ago he thought it was the worst thing that could ever happen to him. So the master is the one who changes his idea about future change by using his own past as the pattern and the prediction of how it's all going to go and how it's all going to be. And by the way, that's true even if things continue to turn out in a way that we call badly, to turn out badly, even after two years. Because our purpose here on the planet is to evolve the human soul. It has nothing to do with your body and your mind. And so even when the worst happens and continues to happen, we see that spiritual masters use those events and those conditions and those circumstances as invitations and opportunities to grow into the fullest expression of who they really are, which is an individuation of divinity. And that gets to the last question you asked. What does it mean to change our identity? My identity, I don't identify with this. This is just something I have. It's a piece of equipment a nice piece of equipment, sophisticated equipment, but equipment nonetheless. This is not me. If, if I got into an accident and I lost my arm, I wouldn't lose a part of me. That, that's, the, that's not me. It's just a, a piece of equipment. My mind is not me either. I don't identify with my mind. I have changed my identity in such a way that I now see who I really am. I see myself as an individuation of divinity itself as a single expression, dare I say this, of God. And frankly, I believe all of life is an expression of God. There is nothing that is not a single expression of God, but there are many 
individuals who do not know that, and so they are not acting in that way. But when we change our identity, we change our fundamental idea of who we are, which then necessarily has a domino effect. If I change my idea of who I am, then I must necessarily change my idea of why I'm here and how I can activate why I'm here and change from concept to experience. I've just described to you what every spiritual master has done in their life. This is all that Jesus did. This is all that Buddha did. This is all that Lao Tzu did. This is all that Helen of Bingen did. This is all that Mother Mary did. This is all that any master, male or female through the years, have done. All they've done is change their idea of who they are. They saw themselves as sacred representations of divinity. It's really quite simple. Mnogi ljudi u stvari doživljavaju jake poruke i najjače i to su najveći izazovi današnjeg doba, bolest. Mogli bismo se zapitati zbog čega danas toga toliko ima i s obzirom da kao što ste rekli svaka promjena u stvari na bolje. I moglo se primijetiti da su mnogi ljudi znanstveno značajno poboljšali svoje zdravstvena stanja ne baveći se liječenjem, ne baveći se prehranom, ne baveći se zapravo ni jednom od tih medijatora i posrednika, nego jednostavnom primjenom ovog što vi pričate, drugim riječima, evo bio sam osobno sam imao prilike vidjeti ljude koji nisu mogli 20 minuta sjediti na mjestu od bolova u leđima da bi se zapravo bavili samo sličnim učenjima da bi se nakon nekog vremena to ne stajalo. Drugim rečima, ovdje i opet ne pričamo o nekakvim stvarnostima koje su toliko iza nas da mi moramo biti visoki i duhovni ljudi, nego pričamo o svakodnevnom životu jer on to zapravo jest. U kojoj mjeri ste do sad vidjeli učinke na zdravlje kada čovjek počne na neki način promatrati svijet iz ovih perspektiva, ovih devet koraka ili kako god to nazvali? Everything changes when we embrace a larger notion of who we are, and when we get our mind to expand the data. Here's the challenge. As I mentioned earlier, the mind is holding all this data that it's received from its parent, you know, from your parents, from your culture, from the story, from the books you read, whether it's the Bible or the Bhagavad Gita or some fairy tale book you read or the movies you see or the TV shows you watch. We're all gathering this information and the mind has got all this information up here and the opportunity is to expand the mind to include information you would never have thought possible, to include the information of the soul to include the larger understanding that an expanded consciousness offers us. When we do that, to answer your question, in my experience, you said, Neil, in your experience, I can tell you my experience. Everything changed overnight. I mean, my financial situation changed virtually in six months. I used to, I was a street person. You may know my history. I lived on the sidewalk and I was a street person, not for a couple of weeks or a bad summer, for, for an entire year. Try it sometime for a year. Go outside next weekend and don't come in for a year with no money in your pocket and no way to earn money. Just, it's an interesting experience. But I went from being a, a, a street person without a penny to his name to a, a, a person who's financially okay. Let's put it that way. And healthy too, I would say. And uh, very healthy. You know, I, I, I've even had open heart surgery and I feel 15 years younger than I felt before the surgery. But I have even faced the, the fear of death, you know, because the, the surgeon said, you know, this is not, we're not taking your tonsils out here. We're not getting a teeth, tooth pulled. We're going to stop your heart for four hours and put you on a machine across the room and we're going to open you up and we're going to give you, you know, new arteries in your heart. I had open heart surgery. I had a, I had a quintuple bypass. I've never felt better before in my life. I feel 15 years younger than I, than I felt before. But it, you see, here's the thing, it's, it was okay if I did it. See, I was so okay with the thought that I might even die, because the, the surgeon said, you know, some people don't get off the table. This is a very delicate operation and you may die. Are you aware of that? I said, yes, I'm aware of that. It's okay. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go forward. Let's do this. So. Everything changes, including your fear of death, which you don't have anymore. Once you don't have a fear of death, you don't have a fear of life. And you can move. Look at you. You look like you're like 31 years old. This is ridiculous. I, happen to, I, have, I have spies who tell me that you're over, older than 31. Actually, I have spies who tell me that you're older than 41. I have spies who tell me that you're... I could go on with it, but look at you. 
So you're a perfect example of this. And everyone who knows you would say that. It's your consciousness and the consciousness of people who are aware that there's more going on here than they thought originally that produces the outcomes that you're, we're talking about. And so now here you are, looking the way you look, sitting in the chair, you talk, and they give you money for that. You have a wonderful, wonderful life. But you are sharing how people everywhere can have the same kind of wonderful life. So they're benefiting from the benefits that flow to you. Therefore, you're a walking demonstration that your life is not really about you. It's about everyone else whose life you touch. And you have found a way to touch thousands and thousands of lives. You ask me what happens, what changes occur? When you shift your consciousness, how do I say this? All of your dreams come true. Ostanemo kod toga. Gospodine Volš, puno vam hvala na ovom razgovoru i sretan put gdje god krenuli. Doviđenja. Hvala. Laha.